Welcome to San Joaquin College of Law Today, a show dedicated to issues and events within the law school, which are of general interest as well. SJCL Today is produced by San Joaquin College of Law, a nonprofit law school in Clovis, founded in 1969 to provide quality legal education. Over 88% of its graduates have passed the California bar examination. More than a quarter of the practicing lawyers in the Fresno area are San Joaquin College of Law graduates. We begin our program with a recent law forum. These events are open to members of the public who are considering becoming attorneys. The first part is led by a faculty member or alumni, followed by students speaking on their law school experiences. This law forum is led by Christina Hathaway, a 2007 graduate who is currently a staff attorney at Central California Legal Services. Shortly after her graduation, her husband enrolled at San Joaquin College of Law. Good evening everyone, my name is Christina Hathaway and as Missy mentioned, I am a staff attorney with a nonprofit uh, legal aid law firm called Central California Legal Services. It's located in downtown Fresno. I graduated from this law school in 2007 and had a great experience here. So I want to share a little bit about that with you and answer any questions that you may have and give you a little bit of information about the law school itself, the history and some requirements that you need to get in. And then the second half of the meeting will be basically a panel of current law students where they're going to share some of their challenges and struggles but also some of the exciting parts about being a law student and also answer any questions that you may have about their experience here. And I am five and a half months pregnant, so I apologize if I get out of breath or if I have to sit down a lot because I get really tired just from talking. So please feel free to interrupt me at any, any time at all. And I want this meeting to be pertinent to you. I want it to be informative and I want it to be meaningful to you. And that's the whole purpose of this meeting is so that you gain the information that you need to decide if this law school is the right law school for you. Okay. Any questions before we start? Okay. And if you don't come up with questions, I'm going to come up with questions. So I encourage you to ask questions. Okay. Um, just a little bit of background about myself, and I'll try to keep it really brief. Um, one of the f first reasons why I decided to go to law school was my family and I came here from Russia, and we were very, very poor, and we could not afford to become citizens. And it took us 22 years to become citizens, actually. And it took us about 17 years to become permanent residents. And usually, if the process is followed correctly, it takes a much shorter amount of time. But we were not familiar with the legal system. We were not familiar with the immigration system. And we could not hire an attorney to educate us and empower us to go through the system in an effective and efficient manner. So that really uh, fueled me, for lack of a better term, to, to really try to do something in the community where I could make a difference. I felt there was a huge injustice that if you didn't have enough money that you really couldn't get the services that you need. And so that is why I currently work not in immigration but for a nonprofit law firm. So that seemed a really strange concept to me thinking, you know, to be an attorney, you make lots of money and, um, you know, you take cases and you have billable hours where you charge your clients and you can certainly do that. But really getting a law degree is more than that. It, can, it doesn't have to be that, certainly can be, but you can do so many things with a law degree. You can teach, you can, um, you can consult, you can mediate, you can, I mean, the list goes on and on. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later. But really, I wanted to get a law degree to empower myself and to try to give back to our community, especially our low-income individuals, because I know that if, um, if, there are not, if there aren't services that help low-income clients, they'll basically be screwed out of the system, for lack of better terms. So I love what I do. I work in landlord-tenant law mostly, um, which is basically I defend people in court that are being evicted out of their homes. Sometimes they're renters. Sometimes they're previous homeowners that lost their home through foreclosure. Sometimes uh, I represent people that are not being evicted but just need repairs or just need attention that they're not getting from their landlord. 
For example, if they're living in a place that's not really fit for human habitation and they've requested um, repairs and they're not getting them, I can step in and really be firm and make sure that I bring it to the landlord's attention, what the laws are, and threaten kindly. Um, and basically we get, we get the repairs done. We get everything usually that needs to be done, done. The other areas of law that I work in is I represent a lot of homeless individuals Currently, we're suing, it's public record, so I can talk about it, we're suing the city of Fresno and a couple of people from Caltrans for basically um, seizing and destroying homeless people's property, such as their tents, their shelters, their clothes, their few little sentimental items that they usually have. And that is in federal court. We have made a few public statements on that. We're not the most liked people in the valley right now because of that, because we're suing you know, the police and many very important people in the city, but we do think it's important that even homeless individuals, people that could never afford an attorney, to be heard, basically. I mean, um, just because something looks like it would be garbage to you and I doesn't necessarily translate to that to a homeless individual. They have very, very few items, and um, when you take the very few possessions that they have, it completely destroys their life and turns it upside down. So that's just an example of some of the things that I do. Um, and a little bit about uh, CCLS, which is our nonprofit law firm. We're the only nonprofit law firm that serves uh, several counties in the Valley. And um, we do a wide array of, of civil matters. So we're kind of like the public defender, but sort of the civil arena of that. And it's a wonderful way to give back to the community. And I love what I do. And um, we don't charge our clients at all. We're completely free. And basically, the only requirements is that you have to either be a United States citizen or a legal permanent resident. You have to be low income. And you just have to have an issue that is an area of law that we assist in. And for seniors, we actually assist all seniors, no matter what their income level is, because we think once you're a senior, um, pretty much if you want to hire an, an outside attorney, private attorney, you certainly can. But um, we have a special grant that allows us to help seniors no matter what the issue is, if it's something that we have some expertise in. So that's a little bit about me and, and what I do. And if you have any questions about that, I'd be happy to answer that. Otherwise, I'll t tell you a little bit about San Joaquin College of Law and, um, excuse me, and some of its history. Any questions so far? a real quiet group okay like I said I will make up questions for you so so a little bit about San Joaquin College of Law it's a fantastic school I'm gonna move over here so you can see me a little bit better it is it was founded in 1969 and it's a private nonprofit law school it was actually founded by several attorneys and a judge in the San Joaquin Valley and the reason they started this law school is because they wanted to have a local law school that was able to serve the community because prior to San Joaquin College of Law, you had to go to like a bigger city like San Francisco or LA, which is great if that's feasible for you. But of course, if you have a family here, if you already have a job here and you're invested in this community, it's not always realistic for you to have to relocate there's also lots of different opportunities in the law school to kind of feel out what you're interested in exactly. For example, there is a law review, which is an agricultural law review. And basically, it's published nationwide, and it's circulated nationwide. And law students write about water issues and agricultural issues that are relevant in the valley. And you basically have, I mean, I don't have any, I was not personally on the law review, but you have a lot of leeway as far as the area of law that you'd like to write in. I think you have to like write in to get accepted into the law review, but it's a great experience to get published and to have that kind of um, experience on your resume and to go through that whole editing and re-editing and re-editing and to really hone your skills as a researcher and writer. It's a wonderful opportunity. And then you could say, I'm published, check out what I did, you know. This is my work that was actually um, read by you know, hundreds and thousands of people. It's a great opportunity. 
one of the best experiences I had here was being a small claims advisor. And what that is, is anyone familiar with small claims court? No. Kind of? Okay. Yeah. yeah. So basically, small claims court is like the layperson's court. So it's a court, it's a real court, room setting, but no attorneys are allowed. And you can sue up to $10,000. It used to be $7,500. But one of the opportunities here at the law school is that you can become a small claims advisor. What does that mean? So when people want to sue without an attorney for up to $10,000, they can call you up and you can give them, it's not really legal advice, but it's legal information because you're not quite an attorney yet, you're a law student and you can't give legal advice prior to that. But you give them legal information such as what is the issue, you gather the facts, and you help them with the paperwork and you can help them with the arguments and you really kind of give them the process of what to do from beginning to end. And you can help as much or as little as you want. But that was a really rewarding experience because you get to work with clients and you get to feel what that's like. It's very different than sometimes how you would imagine how it's portrayed on TV, of course. Uh, people don't just come out and tell you exactly what you want to hear and, you know, it, not in any kind of sequential manner. It's usually all over the place, but it really enables you to practice and to really figure out what you need to get out of your client and how to give it back to them in a way that they're going to understand and in a way that's going to be effective in the courtroom. So that was a wonderful experience here to, to be a small claims advisor, and that's something that you'll probably have the chance to do if you're interested. Another opportunity is the Family Law Mediation Clinic. That was probably my favorite thing to do here. Uh, what that is, is we have a mediation clinic so that uh, divorcing couples can mediate for free. So basically, if husband and wife want to get a divorce, they can certainly file their divorce papers in court. It does take a very long time. But the bad side of that is that a judge who doesn't really know you, or you know, if you were the husband or wife, they don't know you, you're going to go in front of them and they're going to look at your assets, they're going to look at your debts, they're going to see how many kids you have, and they're going to basically make a judgment. They're going to make some sort of order for your life. They're going to determine who gets the kids and how much money goes where. And it's a very um, cold, very not a very intimate procedure. And you may not like the result of what the judge provides to you. So the alternative, and it could also get very ugly, of course, um, but the alternative that they provide at the law school is wonderful, and it's the mediation clinic where a husband and wife can come here voluntarily. It has to be upon their own will. And they get to sit with a law student who is a trained mediator. You'd become a trained mediator by taking the mediation class. And they get to basically just share what their assets are and what their debts are and what they would like. And the other and the husband does this and the wife does this and then you as the mediator get to kind of facilitate a sort of common ground as to what would work best for them not what you think is best but what they think is best for themselves and for their children and for their assets and for their debts and one of the wonderful things about mediation is that it translates into pretty much any other area of law that you want so here it's specifically for divorcing couples couples that want to file for dissolution of their marriage. But really, because it's a confidential procedure, meaning they can feel safe to share with you intimate details that they wouldn't feel comfortable sharing in court, and because it is voluntary, they want to be there, they don't have to be there in front of you, they want to make a difference in their lives, and they want to determine what goes on in their life on a day-to-day -day basis, and because it's self-determinative, meaning they're going to be the ones that decide, it's a really powerful tool for them, and it tends to be very, very successful. And it is much faster, really, and much less um, combative than if you were to go into court and battle it out in front of a judge. So if your husband and wife can agree, basically what you do as the mediator, and it, sometimes it takes a couple sessions with them, and you learn skills. They don't just throw you in there or anything like that, but you learn many different tactics and techniques, and you really just kind of take whatever style fits you the best. And you basically just write up their marriage settlement agreement and they give it to them to file in court. And then in a matter of a couple of months, that becomes the order of the court, meaning they decided what happens with their lives instead of a judge. And I think that's a wonderful opportunity. And I actually use that in my everyday, um, in my everyday practice. I don't do divorcing couples, 
but I mediate landlord tenants all the time. And I use the same exact skills that I learned in class. And so it really can translate into employee, employer, um, into insurance agent, insurance carrier, and insuree. It really can translate into pretty much any area of law that you want. And so it's a wonderful skill and opportunity that I encourage you to, to look into. And another wonderful program that has started I don't know that much information about is the Immigration Clinic, where now the law school can help people become um, naturalized citizens. And I think that's great, because we certainly need help in that area. And um, basically, I kind of went off on a tangent there, because I really like mediation, sorry. So, but really, the idea of getting a JD is, is more than just getting a degree. It is a great resource for the community. And it's a great resource to become more marketable as an employee, of course. One fourth of the attorneys in the Fresno area are actually San Joaquin College of Law graduates. So a lot of the people that graduate from here stay in the valley, and I think that's wonderful. And approximately one third of the uh, attorneys that are currently in the law school identify with a minority group, whether and um, all across the board, so there's lots of color, lots of ethnicities, and about half of the attorneys practicing law right now are women, which is great because we need more women attorneys, and I see lots of women out there, so that's fantastic. So why go to law school? One of the reasons why law school would be good is for your own personal growth. Law school enables you to accomplish tasks that you never really thought were possible. And some examples that I have here is that there was a really quiet girl that never spoke in class, and she became the counsel for Pfizer Pharmaceuticals. Anyone heard of Pfizer Pharmaceuticals? Yeah, a huge corporation, yeah. So, wow, I mean, to be the, the student that never says a word in class to being counsel, attorney, which is just an attorney, another word for attorney, for one of the biggest pharmaceutical companies, if not the biggest, is huge, and of course that would never have been possible without getting your law degree and passing the bar. Um, another example is somebody that became a grocery checker, became a plaintiff's personal injury attorney. So if you think about it, wherever you are now in your career or in your job or in your, your education, you can only improve with your law degree. You certainly can't regress, and it only opens up opportunities. It will not limit you in any way, shape, or form, other than people will have to pay you more money, probably. So, um, of course, the career and employment opportunities will expand for you. Um, you'll get fantastic skills that you will gain going through law school and taking the bar that you can adapt to any situation. Um, especially in the Valley, there are so many underserved populations, and if that is something that really meets your fancy, you definitely will have opportunities to assist in that area or give back in the community in any way, shape, or form that you want. You'll have the tools to be able to do that. And there are, one of the wonderful things about the law school is that because it's in the valley and it's the only one in the valley, there is lots of internships available. And that's probably one of the best things about the law school. If you were like in San Francisco or San Diego or LA or one of the bigger areas, you have to compete with like thousands of other students. Here there is certainly competition. I'm not gonna say that there isn't, but you don't have to be you know, number one in your class to get that one spot. Here, if there's an area of law that you're interested in, pretty much all you have to do would be to speak to one of your professors and let them know your interest, and they can probably connect you with someone that has job opportunities. And you can, I would suggest starting out for free and kind of feeling it out until you get your feet wet. And then basically, you know, you can kind of feel through what feels good to you, what you're comfortable in, and kind of work through that during law school so that by the time you get out of law school, you already know what you want to do. You already have an idea of what your strengths are and what your weaknesses are and how you can sell yourself. Many students already have jobs by the time they graduate. I know I was fortunate enough to have that, and that was because I had an internship um, with CCLS, where I currently work. I had many internships, but none of them felt right. And once I got to the, my current workplace, I just knew that this was it, and they were very patient with me, and they basically worked with me, and um, so I didn't have to job hunt. And that's not something that you'll find in the bigger cities. So that's a wonderful, wonderful opportunity to have here. And 
another another area that you might be interested in is what is the law school education like it's pretty intense it's pretty diverse here in the sense that um, we offer day classes now where we offer classes each class twice a week and we also have that's a three-year program but we also have four-year programs and five-year programs so that if you have a job that you just cannot let go of for financial reasons or you're supporting your family you don't have to give that up you can certainly balance both of those things at the same time our bar pass rate is great I think uh, for 2011 our graduating class was over 70 percent for a first-time pass rate bar passers passing the bar is not easy um, and you know under one standard under the ABA regulations uh, over the past five years the graduates have to pass within five years and their their goal is to have 75 percent pass rate but San Joaquin College of Laws was 79 percent so it was actually higher than that which I think is very impressive. I think that shows the dedication of the professors that we have. And it, um, for example, some statistics, if you guys like math and numbers. In 2008, our statistics were 83% bar pass rate. For 2009, it was 82% bar pass rate. And in 2010, it was an 84% pass rate, which is fantastic. And that really, really speaks volumes about the kind of education and kind of tailored education that you're gonna get here. We have really small classes. And we have a full-time faculty staff that is accessible pretty much at any time, if not during office hours, but through email. And one of the nice things is that the staff know you as an individual versus just some student or some student number. They really take the time to answer your questions. And if you need extra attention, you can certainly feel comfortable in seeking that out and they'll be able to provide that to you. So what does, you know, what does it take to get into law school? They take a look at your GPA, and they take a look at your LSAT score, which is the law school admission test. And they like for you to have at least a 150 or higher. Um, they have accepted people with a little slightly lower LSAT score. If you can kind of, um, if you have strengths in the letters of recommendation and in your GPA and in your community activities. So it doesn't, it's not like a clear cut kind of cut off. Um, they also like you to have a 3.0 or higher. And if you, if you don't, so if like, let's say you don't have a 150, don't freak out. You know, one thing that you can do is before you take the LSAT, if you haven't already, is you can you know just practice you don't have to take one of the courses it certainly helps if you can afford it but just practice taking the timed um, the LSAT test over and over again until you get a 150 and then go ahead and take it and even if you did take it and you received a score that was lower than that you can always take it again and, and certain places will average it together certain places will just look at both of your scores so don't disqualify yourself automatically just because you don't have a 3.0 or a 150 but um, if you are lacking one of those areas, try to beef up the other areas. Like make sure your letters of recommendation are really good. You have to have three of them and make sure that they speak to you as a student or as, an, as a worker that really highlights how and why you would succeed as a law student here. Financing your education, we already talked a little bit about that. Right now, it costs about $825 per unit to take a class, to take um, at San Joaquin College of Law. You need 86 units total to graduate. The price does go up about $25 a unit per year. So you can take that into account. Um, but it's still quite affordable, especially when it's compared to the larger law, law schools. For example, um, just to give you a breakdown, if you, for 2012-2013, if you were going to do the four-year plan, it costs about $17,738 a year. And for the five-year five -year plan, it's about $14,190 a year. And of course, the, I don't know if that actually takes into account the increase, but that's based on just for 2012, 2013. So it's still, it is a lot of money. I'm not gonna say that that's cheap in any way, shape, or form, but it's a huge, huge amount of difference compared to the, the larger law, for, law, law schools. For example, Stanford is about 47,000 a year, 
and Santa Clara is about 41,000 a year. Uh, Loyola is 43,000 a year, McGeorge is 41,000 a year, and even the, the, even the schools that are lesser known than that are usually above 25,000 a year. And that does not really take into account um, anything outside, you know, that's just the tuition really. And, and you know, you have to include housing of course, and food and gas and all of that kind of stuff. So there are financial aid loans available and most of our students do take financial aid loans out. There's work study and there's scholarships and there's grants available as well. Okay, well if you guys wanna take a break, we have uh, restrooms are right outside the door here to your left and there's some refreshments and some snacks in the back and basically I think at eight o'clock? At 10-2. At 10-2, okay, so like a 10 minute break and then if you wanna come back here, I'm gonna have some law students and you can ask them specific questions if you'd like. I came to law school uh, just because I was a history major back in undergrad and always enjoyed learning about uh, why things are the way they are um, through either historical reasons or now why the government runs the way that it is and having a knowledge of law and a base of uh, how we got to this point. Uh, a lot of classes will start at the very beginning, you know, take real property for example, you you spend the first uh, month of the class learning about how everything was back in old England and it transitions through to what the law is today. So it gives you a good idea of the, the th theory behind why things are currently the way that they are and my desire to understand that and then hopefully a few years down the road maybe influence that uh, were my reasons for why I wanted to come to law school. Great, thanks. Uh, hi, my name is Charlie Hamamjian, and I am just entering my second year of law school, so that means I just finished my first one. And let me tell you, it feels great to be done with it, because the first year really is the, the, the I, I think, was the, the hardest for me, at least, so far, because, um, you know, it's definitely a change coming to law school. It was a change for me. Uh, I came from Fresno State. I was a business major at Fresno State. Um, you know, after that, I went to work for my family business in produce and doing some sales there. And, you know, I just decided that I kind of always wanted to, was interested in law. And um, I, I had heard it was, you know, a great education. And, you know, I, you know, kind of researched a little bit, you know, what kind of grad school I was thinking about going. Because, I mean, obviously, there's just a lot of choices. Um, being a business student, the most obvious thing would be to just, do, you know, do the MBA and kind of continue on that path. But, um, you know, I, I had always had, like, you know, the interest, the drive, uh, you know, as I got older, I kind of started reading um, more about, you know, what's going on with the government, as Keith said, you know, these different laws that are getting passed, and, you know, I never really understood it, and, you know, I, I found myself, um, you know, wanting to do more than just being a, be a salesman, so I thought, you know, the law was, law was the way to go for me. It's been a great experience so far. Um, I actually was one of the People, uh, some people say crazy enough, but I came to school with my girlfriend. We started um, school out together, so um, it's been great to have her here. Uh, some things I've learned through the first year of law school is that it's really, really important to find somebody else that is putting in the same amount of work as you, or, or you know, pushing you to put in the most the, the most amount of work that you can. Because what you are going to find is that it's it's although sometimes class can kind of feel like your undergrad, where you know it's 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 class. You know, you go, you sit, you, you hear the guy lecture and you know, they ask you questions about what you read. Sometimes you kind of try and zone out or, you know, do whatever. But um, it's definitely where you make your mark is outside of class, the classroom and budgeting your time along with, you know, your, your schedule. I, I continued on working um, as a salesman. I, I still work in my family business now and I come to school in, in the evenings. And so um, if you're interested in the law, I, I definitely suggest coming to school here. I, being a local guy, I found it. Um, SJC was willing to work with my schedule so I could continue working and um, come to school. Um, I am going to try the three-year program, however, so I'm going to have to find a little bit uh, better way to, to budget my time with work. But yeah, I mean, it's a great experience. I've really enjoyed it, and I would highly recommend it to anybody interested in coming. Hi, I'm Marla. I'm sorry I'm so late. Um, I am actually starting my uh, fourth year here next year. Uh, I got my undergrad at Sacramento State in sociology, 
And um, let's see, what's the rest of it? <laughs> Why you came to law school? Uh, I actually came to law school. I was going between getting a master's in sociology and law s and getting juris doctorate, and it just seemed like this this route kind of gave me more options. Um, right now, I people keep asking me, you know, what are you going to specialize in? What are you going to specialize in? I, you know, and I don't think it's a bad thing, but I don't know. You know, and I don't feel scared about that because I know that, you know, we, we could kind of go anywhere. We could do what we want. You know, you could, you don't really have to be stuck in one area. You know, you could go somewhere, feel what you, if you like it, jump somewhere else. Um, I just recently got a job at a personal injury law firm uh, in, um, in February. And it's, it's, it's interesting. You know, I'm learning a lot. Um, I didn't start uh, a job at a law firm right away. I actually started off law school. Um, I, didn't, I didn't think I wanted to work. So I had a lot of time on my hands. And for me, um, for just for myself, it wasn't a good thing. So I started working, uh, but not at a law firm. And um, I thought that was a good thing because you know I didn't really want to bombard myself too much. Um, and now I started at a law firm and I realized how much I'm missing out or how much I missed out, so it, it's kind of a good thing. If you're working full time, you're going to class at night, let's say, Yeah. how do the internships work? And obviously it's gonna be a lot of work. You know, there's a certain amount of hours you have to put for your internship, so it's not just a amount of period of time. They actually do it by hours, so what you're doing is you're, you're learning by amount of hours, just the same amount that you would be in class for that. So, um, w you know, whether you're able to do that in four weeks or six weeks or eight weeks, depending on your schedule and how you would work that with school, that kind of works, uh, that kind of has to do with who you go to work with, who you choose to go um, do your I internship with. There's a lot, I mean, there's lots of options. You know, the, the DA's office is always willing to take people here in Fresno or Madera, I mean, somewhere around here. The school puts up lots of opportunities through the email and um, they're really helpful about finding someone that's gonna work for you. And especially if you're interested in a cer certain area of law, like they, like I said, they, they, they send you stuff every, I mean, it seems like almost every day you're getting, you know, this person's looking for an intern here or, you know, maybe a job opportunity here. So there's definitely different ways you can go and they'll certainly work with you. I mean, it, like I said, just as long as you find someone that's going to work with you, I think most people are understanding, you know, as being as you're going to go work for a lawyer and they also went through law school. So I think that also kind of helps. And just kind of to clarify a little bit, uh, one of the good things about SJCL is how they work for, with your schedule and how the different programs uh, kind of help you for whatever your personal needs are. If you go with the three-year route, um, then you're going to school 20, or you're going to school year-round. Uh, you have about two weeks off in the beginning of the summer, two weeks off at the end of the summer, two weeks off in winter. But other than that, er, and during those time periods, you're required to get internships. Uh, but if you decide to go the four-year route, um, now you're not required to get any internship whatsoever, and you can graduate you know, just doing the night classes. Uh, you don't ever have to do anything during the daytime. So that makes it a little bit easier for the four-year program. So first year, you're going to have, I, I think they're actually putting another class in for you guys, but I had four classes that were three hours a day. Um, I had two during the day and two at night is what my schedule worked out to be. And um, for me, like the workload with, I've never been one of those people that's been able to, you know, do six, seven hours of homework at one time. I get a little bit distracted easier than that. So my advice to you is uh, what I did is I would make sure that I did something every day. Like there's law school is, is definitely a commitment, especially in your first year when you're really trying to figure out not only the, the rules and the law, but like how they want you to write it. And it's definitely a style that you have to learn. So I, for me, I would just put do something. I'd make sure that I, I set a lot aside at least an hour every day to do my homework. And um, it, on top of that, you know, maybe 30, 40 minutes of studying every day to, you know, just whether it's making study aids or just reading back over something that I don't understand. And then during, you know, obviously d during test week, I picked it up a little bit more. I do, you know, several hours every day. But um, I found that worked for me. Um, sometimes my, my girlfriend, she kind of likes to do the longer study sessions which didn't really always work out for me. And so, it, you know, come, if we came to school together or whatnot. But um, so, I mean, everybody's got different styles, but it definitely is a certain amount of hours that every, everybody puts in a certain amount of hours through the school. So you're definitely going to find yourself um, having to set aside that time. I try to have a class every night. So I go four days a week, Monday through Thursday. Um, I generally try to do uh, 
like Charlie, I, I can't do more than three hours at a time. Uh, you know, it, that's as long as I can take to soak things in. Uh, so I'll probably go on the weekends um, two, two sessions of three hours. And that's how much I'll study. And you know, when y you kind of get your readings in, you kind of learn how to pick up what you need to. And uh, you know, in those three hours, you could get a lot done. I mean, you just need to review what you need to and whatnot. Um, yeah, sh she gave a great example of you know what the average week is, and then I guess I would highlight how that completely goes out the window come finals and midterms. <laughs> <laughs> um, in undergrad, I could start cramming for something. Uh, usually about three, four days out, and I would be perfectly fine. In law school, you start cramming five, five, six weeks out, and you barely have enough time to get it all in. Um, so for me, you know, in, in the month leading up to finals, you're now putting in, you know, I, I would go from the 45 minutes a day to, I probably should be doing more, but um, I'd go from that to now finals, you know, you're doing multiple practice exams a day, and uh, really just kind of, especially your first year, your first year, like we talked about, it's all, you know, learning how everything is supposed to be done. So you're learning how to write a law school exam, which is completely different than any other style of writing you've done in your life. Um, so you're just, you know, you're really just going at it, trying to learn what the teachers are expecting, blah, 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 all that fun stuff. Um, so if you were to ask me during, you know, the first three months of a semester, what do I think of law school? I'd say I'd tell you it's a, I actually love it more than almost any other time period of my life. You know, you're you're learning something that's really interesting. You're driven to do well. You're hanging out with uh, the school is. I think I mentioned this. The school is really close knit. So you're with a bunch of other people who you're not fighting against each other to get good grades. You're fighting with each other to all do as well as you can. Um, and so in that aspect, I absolutely love law school. But then you get into that month before finals and final season, and everybody just kind of goes insane. Um, but but you you manage to survive, and it it really it really turns out well. Um, you know, you struggle for those last five weeks, and you know, at the end, you're like, "Wow, I can't believe I I pulled through this. Yeah. I survived." Uh, most of the students here, you know, we're all active. Uh, we try to hit the gym. Most of the students here. We tend to hit the bar, um, <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, once in a once in a great while. Um, but even those aspects, and the one thing that, I, if if, I, if there was only one thing I would suggest is let law school consume your life. At least that's what I let, or what I think worked for me. You know, I threw myself in 100 percent. You know. And you know, classes get done. What are you going to do? Oh, we went and hung out with our study group. You know, you go sit around a pitcher, and you know, you start uh, just kind of BSing. And out of nowhere, now you're having a discussion on what you know type of contract law applies to the scenario. Um, so the more that you let it just kind of take over your life, the more that you'll really soak everything up, and the better an experience, better of an experience you'll get, and the more you'll get out of this. Um, yeah, the beginning of law school will come at you uh, really fast. Um, they'll, you're going to start off your first week, and you're going to think, like, oh, my God, this class has 70 pages, and the other class has 80 pages, and this class has 50 pages. And then, So you're going to definitely be thrown into the mix with as far as, like, the reading that to expect. And the cases are actually kind of cool to read because people do crazy stuff, and <laughs> which you'll find out. There, there's always something, I mean, th interesting in the cases. I mean, and uh, I, I mean, as far as getting through my first year, I, I didn't have a background in law at all, and I didn't find it as a disadvantage um, really in any class, maybe in the legal analysis class, because uh, depending on what you're going to do in your law firm, they might have you briefing cases already. And like Keith said, that's a really important part, and especially with that class, because it's a class that will take up a lot of your time if you don't know how to brief a case, because you're going to find yourself reading through these cases and trying to put, put it together for your teacher. And so, I mean... Yeah, I, I don't really know what to suggest to get ready for law school. Just get re like he said, get ready to um, you know hit the ground running and ke keep an open mind, as she said, and adapt to what they're going to give you because it's going to seem like a lot at first, but you'll get the hang of it. I was going to add to that. You guys had great answers. I don't even know if I need this. Is this okay? So I agree with everything you guys said, but you really touched on something in that somebody told me before you enter law school 
read, 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 read everything that you can. And the purpose of that is to basically speed up your reading comprehension. I mean, I would read cereal boxes. I would read ingredients. I would read newspapers. I, I took that to heart, and I literally read everything. And that did. It really did increase my ability to soak in the information and feel comfortable with it. So it doesn't matter what you read. It could be fiction. It could be anything at all. But just the more you read, the easier you're going to get through those 70 or 80 pages per class that you need for every single day that you attend. And the faster you're going to get and the better you're going to get at that. And the other thing that I agree that you said, Keith, is that clear your, mi clear your mind. You definitely want to try to take care of any outside issues that you can before you start. It is a commitment not only for your time-wise, you know, but also mentally and emotionally. So if there are things that you've been putting off that you know are going to bug you, that you're going to be thinking about during class or that are going to distract you, take care of those things. Don't wait until tomorrow. Take care of as many issues as you can before you start so that you have no excuse to really fully dedicate yourself and immerse yourself in it. And what you said, Marla, is that, you know, you wish you had started maybe a little bit earlier with the internship. And I agree, the earlier you start, the better. I absolutely agree with that. But I also agree with what you said, that it's certainly not going to work against you if you don't have that legal office job beforehand. I, like Charlie, did not have any legal experience um, in before starting law school. I do not think it was a disadvantage. I certainly remember being in class and thinking, wow, all these people already have law jobs and they already know what they're doing and I feel so disadvantaged. I don't know if you guys felt that way too, but the reality is you'll have that opportunity during law school. It would not hurt if you had it, but it's not gonna work against you. And you already have so many skills and work experience that you can bring to the table without even realizing it. And you know, you will as you learn different aspects and skills and tools in class, you'll realize, oh gosh, that's kind of like what I did in such and such job. And so don't discount the experience that you already have. I'm not gonna lie, it, it's hard work. And every once in a while, you know, you're gonna think, God, what I get into? But it, it's very rewarding. You know, it's it's nice seeing what you could put yourself through and realizing that, you know, you could do it. You really can. You'll really surprise yourself. Um, you know, it's 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 uh, for me, I, I, I like learning the, the concepts, you know, and just be able to go to work and talk to somebody about it or talk to each other about it. Uh, that's definitely rewarding. Uh, and, it, and I think you also make a lot of good friends like I. I think I said this last time too. Is I, I've made a lot of friends that are, uh, that you know I know that we're gonna be friends for the rest of my life, and like the camaraderie is definitely different and interesting. It's very rewarding. So yeah, I w I would probably just echo exactly what she said: is the sense of community and camaraderie that you get here. Uh, you're going through these stressful times, and people see you, you know, <laughs> at your base. And um, I I ended up joining the legal fraternity here and have absolutely loved it. Um, it's called DTP, and through that you get to meet like upperclassmen and they have like social events to hang out, and so just kind of all these, uh, you know, all these new friends that you make who just kind of really get what you're going through, who because of, you know, how stressful this time is, they will be with you forever. Uh, that's kind of what I really enjoy about this place. Yeah, um, I also joined DTP, DTP. This is the president of DTP right here. Also, he's giving himself a plug. I just wanted to add that in there. Um, <laughs> no, uh, <laughs> yeah, no. So um, definitely seeing how far I've come, I guess you know, uh, is what I've enjoyed most about law school. Is is um, like these guys have said. You know, it's a, it's an uphill challenge the entire time, and you know, being able to survive it, and um, you know really push yourself and come through it and be ready to take on more stuff is, you know, it's, it's just rewarding to feel like that. So that's been my most enjoyable part is just knowing that, um, you know, seeing how far I've come and how much I've learned in the last year is, is just a, it's just a good feeling to, to feel like to get that over with.
San Joaquin College of Law has two free legal clinics operated by students and overseen by faculty members. SJCL students are doing groundbreaking work in non-adversarial property division agreements and divorces in the mediation clinic. Clients meet with a student to work out a marital settlement agreement, which can then be filed with the court. The New American Legal Clinic assists legal immigrants in obtaining citizenship, working through the processes of naturalization. The Now Clinic also assists those seeking family-based immigrant visas or U visas, depending upon eligibility. Hi, I'm Justin Atkinson. Welcome. Uh, I'm from the New American Legal Clinic here at the San Joaquin College of Law. It's the immigration clinic where we provide free services to people. Um, I'm talking today about deferred action. I'm sure you've heard deferred action on the news. It's the uh, President Obama announced um, what's called deferred action. I'm going to speak a little bit about that today. I want to tell you where deferred action comes from. Now, in our system, the executive branch um, is tasked um, with the enforcement of all of our laws, including immigration laws. And so what um, deferred action comes from is prosecutorial discretion, meaning that the executive branch can decide whom to prosecute. So essentially they're going to go after high targets and targets that have the committed felonies, that sort of thing. So in the immigration system, um, what the executive branch has done is allowed prosecutors, allowed the government to go after what's called the high targets. Um, not necessarily every illegal Im immigrant, but those that have committed serious crimes are the ones that are going to be targeted. Now, under that rubric of uh, prosecutorial discretion, we have something called deferred action. And this is for uh, children that came to the United States basically as children before they were 16 and for no, through no fault, fault of their own and they don't have any paperwork um, and, and have gone to school, have graduated. I'm going to give a little bit of those requirements here in a minute. But the first thing I want to talk about is what it's not. Number one, it's not any type of legal status. It's not a pathway to citizenship. It's nothing of the sort. What deferred action is, is a basically a protection for two years against deportation and the ability to work. Um, now this two years can be um, extended for two more, but right now we have basically four years of deportation protection and the ability to work. Again, there's no pathway to citizenship. It doesn't grant any type of legal status. All it is is a protection against deportation. Recently, I've been talking a lot about deferred action um, to many different groups of people, and there seems to be a lot of confusion. And what I want to make clear is that there are no applications yet. There's no way you can be put on any list, to, on any waiting list to, to apply for deferred action. Uh, I was giving a, a presentation to a group of about 200 people, and I asked if any of them have, have, had been approached by anyone uh, offering to do deferred action for, for payment of money, and half of the people raised their hands. And I thought that's basically impossible. Um, they're trying to scam you, which happens a lot in the, in the Central Valley because there's really a lack of immigration attorneys here, or competent immigration attorneys. Um, so again, I, I told these, like I tell everybody, that there's no application yet. We have to wait till mid-August to find out exactly what the process is going to be. And even then, we're not sure what that process will be. I've given you the information that we have until now. So if someone's offering to, to help you with deferred action right now, it's a scam. Now, we're talking about um, students, we're talking about um, children, people that, have, that were brought here through no fault of their own before the age of 16. If that is the case for someone that were brought here before they were 16, if they haven't committed any crimes, any significant crimes, um, if they've committed a felony, they don't, they, can't, um, they don't qualify. If they've committed several misdemeanors, they don't qualify, right? Okay, so number one, get here before they were 16, brought here before they were 16. Number two, they can't have committed um, serious crimes. Number three, um, a person qualifying for this deferred action must have on June 15th, 2012, when the announcement was, was done, they must be currently enrolled in school or have graduated from school or um, have served in the armed forces and been, um, been and basically not have been dishonorably discharged. Um, on top of that, you cannot apply for over 30 years of age. So again, those are the requirements for deferred action. We're not talking about any legal status. We're talking about, um, about children that were brought here, adolescents now, those that are, or even um, um, university students, those under 30 that have, that have basically been a good part of our, our society, that have been a productive part of our economy. 
um, we're trying to give them a protection against um, being deported because these students, these people have grown up here. And what does deportation mean um, if you've never been to the place where you're going to be deported or haven't been there since you were a very young child? Um, that's what deferred action is. I'm Justin Atkinson here at the New American Legal Clinic at the San Joaquin College of Law. Thank you for listening. The success of San Joaquin College of Law is both measured and reflected by the success of its alumni. Among the more than 1,300 graduates are 24 judges and court commissioners, the Fresno, Tulare, and Madera County District Attorneys, the California Health and Human Services Secretary, and practitioners in every area of public and private service. We're pleased to offer this portion of San Joaquin College of Law today to a member of that alumni rank. Hi there, I'm Elizabeth Waldo. I'm graduated at San Joaquin College of Law as a class of 2009. After law school, I you know, worked at a couple different firms and right now I'm working at Weiss, Martin, Salinas and Hearst. We do medical malpractice defense. But I really wanna talk about some of the other passions that I have regarding community service. In particular, I'm helping coordinate Senior Law Day in cooperation with San Joaquin College of Law and Central California Legal Services and the Department of Motor Vehicles. On October 27th, we're going to put on a seminar here at the law school that will start at 9 o'clock and go till around 12 or 12.30, depending on attendance and questions. And hopefully, we'll cover some key issues that seniors have questions about, including topics such as wills, trust, as well as financial scams that target seniors. And then Department of Motor Vehicles licensing, uh, driving as you age, and some of your rights should you have your license challenged by the DMV. Now, I'm really excited about helping seniors with legal issues. Oftentimes, this is an, an underrepresented portion of our community. In working with Central California Legal Services, I think I found a really exciting group of people who are as committed to, to helping some of these underrepresented portions of the population as I am as also. So if you're available and interested, I would really encourage you to, to show up on October 27th, which is a Saturday here at the law school. And if you have a need to meet in particular, with one of the volunteer attorneys from Central California Legal Services. You can set up an appointment for that day by contacting the Clovis Senior Center. So I look forward to, to helping serve the community as I progress in my career with the law. And I think that being an attorney puts you in a particularly advantageous place to give back to the community and be very active in issues that you care about. Thank you, I'm Beth Waldo at Weiss Martin, Salinas and Hearst, class of 2009. The San Joaquin Agricultural Law Review, founded in 1990, is the oldest agricultural law review in the country. It is published by the students of San Joaquin College of Law, which is located in California's Central Valley, one of the richest agricultural regions in the world. The law review presents student and scholar works on legal issues affecting agriculture, but the topics are also of special interest to those in government, business, and law. The San Joaquin Agricultural Law Review provides an objective national forum for analyzing issues affecting agriculture. It's received judicial and critical recognition, and its articles have been cited by the California Supreme Court, the California Appellate Court, the United States District Court, and others. Articles have also been cited in the annotations of several California statutes. My name is Lisa Craig. I'm the Editor-in-Chief for the San Joaquin Agricultural Law Review, and my comment is titled, Childhood Obesity, the Unhealthy School Lunch, and School Liability Under 42 United States Code 1983. I chose this topic because last year a lot of TV specials had started talking about the issue of unhealthy school lunches. I started watching um, Jamie Oliver's Food Revolution, which was a TV show that spring that kind of went over the problem with obesity in general um, in the United States. And he looked specifically to childhood obesity and what kids are eating these days, looking at everything from school lunches to what they're eating out during just their free time, snacks, vending machines. So it kind of got me interested in the whole issue of why are school lunches so unhealthy when we have all this food that's abundant, especially in this area. 
So the more I looked into it, I found out that Congress had recently passed in December 2010 a new act to accompany the National School Lunch Program that was titled Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act. So the new administration, um, President Obama and his wife, Michelle Obama, had kind of put up a task force that was supposed to deal with the issue of childhood obesity. And looking into it, I realized that a lot of things that go into school lunches are on the federal level. I found out looking through my comment during research that the federal level, uh, the USDA, actually provides a lot of the food that school districts use to use in their school lunches. So the USDA has what they call a commodities program. So my comment actually focused a lot on the USDA, so that's where it had the ag connection in what are they providing in this commodity program, and if the food is supposed to be healthy that they're providing, why are the school lunches so bad, and why are one-third of the nation's kids obese or overweight? So looking into it and basing uh, my research on what had just been done with this new act in the National School Lunch Program. I found that on the federal level, a lot of things have been done in the recent years to actually make school lunches healthy. So a lot of the issues that were still arising were on the state and that school district level themselves. So my comment in the legal issue examined if these school districts are still failing to meet the nutritional standards in providing healthy school lunches, can they actually be legally liable for the obesity that these kids are experiencing based on eating these school lunches? So I tied it in to um, a civil rights issue. So 42 United States Code 1983 comes from the 14th Amendment, which is when a person or entity working under the color of state law deprive somebody of a constitutionally protected right. So I based this off of the actual obesity itself that kids are experiencing. Um, a lot of research recently has shown that kids who eat school lunches consistently are 29% more likely to be overweight and obese. And people are finding that there is a correlation between kids eating just that school lunch five times a day and being overweight and obese. A lot of the issue is that school districts themselves are getting commodity foods from the USDA, the so potatoes and cheese and uh, tomatoes and flour, and then they're taking that and they're sending it on their own to food processing plants where they're turning them into frozen pizzas and tater tots and all those things that kids like to eat but are really unhealthy. And when they're going into those food processing plants, they're getting sodium and sugar and all these obesity triggers added into the food. And then that's what these kids are getting on a consistent basis. I mean, if that's all you're gonna eat for the day, fine. But a lot of these lunches have over half of the needed sodium or almost all your daily sugar intake. So it's pretty much setting up these kids for failure because in one meal alone, they're getting all the sodium and all the sugar that is required or that they need for the day. So anything they eat outside of the school is just gonna add to that. So it's kind of no wonder that a lot of these kids are becoming seriously obese. So my comment just addresses the issue if these school districts continue to do this and fail to actually improve their school lunches when they have the opportunity to, given that they're getting a lot of healthy um, food from the USDA that they can turn into nutritional meals. If they continue to behave that way, if children can actually sue them for a deprivation of health. So this is what my comment addresses. I'm Lisa Craig for the San Joaquin Agricultural Law Review, and thank you for watching. And that brings us to the end of this edition of San Joaquin College of Law Today, presented by San Joaquin College of Law, a nonprofit law school committed to educational excellence and community service.
The views expressed do not necessarily reflect the position or views of San Joaquin College of Law. This program has been produced in conjunction with the Community Media Access Collaborative. We invite you to join us in the future as we explore issues and events within the law school which are of general interest as well. For more information about San Joaquin College of Law, please visit our website at www.sjcl.edu or call 559-323-2100.